here. So it's the famous photo of the, the famous <laughs> code, <laughs> software which is QuickPan. But now we have a new software called MadeMobileJ, and we want to learn more. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you, for organizers, to, to bring me in to, to give this talk and show a little bit of what I'm doing. Uh, or we're doing it well, sorry. Uh, so I want to tell you briefly about QuickPalm and then how we're transitioning to, to NanaJ. Uh, so I, I guess there's not much I can tell about QuickPalm because, uh, I mean, it was published in 2010, and I guess most of you at some point either tried it or use it uh, in your research. Um, it's, it's an easy algorithm in the sense that it's, it's based on center of mass, uh, it's extremely fast in terms of computation. And one of the things that I really wanted to do with QuickBomb was this bit, um, too many lasers, uh, this uh, bit here where I wanted to actually to massively parallelize the calculations. So pretty much what QuickBomb is trying to do is to run each frame in, in its separate thread, which means that I can actually do the calculations quite fast. Um, so. Uh, once we started uh, getting citations on QuickBomb, it was quite interesting because uh, I started looking a little bit who is citing us. And about 30% of it is reviews, 40% of it is about uh, its biological papers. And the interesting part is 30% is other algorithms that are ranking against QuickBomb. And the reason why it was quite funny, the first paper that ranked against QuickBomb, I thought, damn it, now, now someone has something better, uh, no one is going to cite me anymore. Uh, but they kept on citing, uh, and everyone kept on comparing against QuickBomb. Uh, but is, this also highlights the fact that these, these challenges are quite interesting, because they make a fair comparison between algorithms. And in no way, QuickBomb is going to be the best algorithm, but it's actually nice to have a third party doing those, uh, um, those tests, uh, because uh, many authors can be unfair on these comparisons. So, what are we up to uh, meanwhile? Uh, I started the lab, and with the start of the lab, I started uh, with a team developing NanoJ. Now, NanoJ is actually just a library for, for ImageJ, uh, but it's a library that allows you to do OpenCL um, integration. So, pretty much what we try to do with uh, NanoJ is to convert your gaming workstation, which is not that uh, expensive, into a cluster. Uh, so every time we start using uh, OpenCL in our calculations, we end up with a 10 to 100 times speed up in terms of calculations. So this enables us to do a lot of things in terms of uh, image analysis, uh, but most importantly, uh, it enabled us to get to these guys that you see here. One is Virus Mapper, which is a single particle uh, analysis algorithm that David, who is on the audience, is going to talk about it on Tuesday. Uh, and the other one is Surf. So, uh, for the second half of my talk in five minutes, I'm going to tell you quickly why, what is SURF and why is NanoJ enabling SURF at the end of the day. So, SURF came from this. You've all seen this before, you're probably fed up of it, but there's one important part here, which is this one. And if you start thinking about electron microscopy, it's been several decades since it gives us the same resolution that we get with uh, super resolution. Um, so, you can argue about market specificity and you can see things that you can see before. Uh, with, uh, with super resolution, because you're using fluorescence. But uh, one reviewer, reviewer number two, right? Uh, one reviewer on the grant that I wrote for Human Frontiers uh, told me this. Uh, this would be a great project for cryo -EM. And And although I was really annoyed, it's, it's arguable. It's, it's true. Uh, so the question is, what can we do with super resolution that we can do with EM? Well, the easy answer is live cell, right? And to do live cell, um, you really need to decrease the amount of laser power we have on your samples. So that means that we really need to go into high densities of fluorophores. force. Uh, and that's what SURF is about. Uh, it will work very well for a low density, but it uh, works amazingly well, well uh, for high density. So I'm just going to briefly show you how it works. So here's 100 frames uh, of a sample illuminated at 40 milliwatts per square centimeter. Uh, so what we do is uh, we break each pixel into a virtual pixel. So we create two pixels within each pixel. And we borrow some ideas from uh, radial symmetry. Radial symmetry was one of the best ranked algorithms on the last context. And instead of using radial symmetry per se, we converted radial symmetry into a new mathematical transform. So that mathematical transform, what it does, it tries to map regions of space that are highly radially symmetric. What that means is whenever you have a through for that's highly radially symmetric, and if we apply this transform, it pretty much maps out what it thinks is the center of that through for. So it ends up, ah, 
it right. And we do this for every subpixel we have there. Uh, now, you might think, well, that's going to be massive in terms of computation. And that's the reason why we, do, we use uh, peak cool computation, so we, that we compress down to where we need, sorry, peak detection, with, so that we can compress down where we're actually hookabiting those, those peaks. Uh, and that's where NanoJ comes in, because since I'm doing this on the GPU and not on the CPU, I can massively parallelize these calculations. So all this is done almost in parallel, uh, simultaneously. So we do it extremely fast. Right, so how does this look like? Once we start applying that uh, special transform, we end up with something like this. And, and pretty much you start seeing that, oh, okay, so there, there are some peaks that are being extracted here from, from these uh, profiles. And the cool bit is you visually, can, by inspection, you can't even see particles blinking there, but the algorithm is already starting to pull those guys apart. So I'm just going to speed that, this up a little bit. And here we go. So now I'm doing 100 frames per second. And immediately you start getting structure from there, and you start seeing that we, um, that we start getting super resolution. Uh, however, what I'm showing you here is just increasing the speed at which I'm applying the transform over, a, a frame, uh, over 100 frames per second. Now, this is where we can actually borrow some ideas from Sophie, because uh, this is just plotting this information. But if I start using temporal correlations on this data, what happens at the end is that I start querying this out, and, and, and I end up with a pretty decent uh, reconstruction of what those filaments are in space. Good. So, what have we done with this? Um, so, bottom line, for a very dead cell and fixed, uh, surf is very similar to palm storm. And you might even use other algorithms. You will get equivalent results, or sometimes even, you know, I'm not even declaring that you're going to get better precision than what you get with surf. But for a live cell, labeled with GFP, using mu watts instead of uh, kilowatts, which is typical with what we use on uh, this storm, for example, uh, we end up with this. So what you're seeing here uh, is just microchips labeled with GFP. And we often get better resolution than SIM at a faster speed with less illumination and no special optics. So this is just pretty much your general turf or wide field microscope that we're using at the end of the day. So what are we using this for? Uh, we've been looking at mitochondria uh, here also, and into immunological synapses. This is data that we acquired in cooperation with, um, where are you in the audience? With Dylan. Um, and the, the most interesting thing about this is that uh, because SURF can deal with very large amounts of uh, profiles overlapping, uh, we can actually use almost any microscope to get a super resolution image. So here you're using, we're using a classical wide field microscope. This is a laser scanning uh, confocal microscope. And because SURF is purely analytical, you can really apply and extract super resolution out of these systems. Uh, just to round it up, for example, here is a spinning disk data set. SURF is not 3D. What you're seeing there is just optical sectioning, and you're extracting uh, super resolution in XY. Uh, but you can actually run this on a spinning disk, and the algorithm is so fast that you just need 100 frames that you can actually get a very decent reconstruction. So this is a live QSL expressing uh, to GFP. And that's it. That's my 10 minutes. Uh, this is a small movie of everything being developed uh, until now, or until last week. And many thing, people to, to thank, but um, the, the sign-up stuff you've seen here was uh, in cooperation with Dylan, and um, Jason's is one of our big cooperations uh, with which we do virus uh, imaging. And thank you for listening. So artifacts, yes, uh, they are. Um, so SURF is relying on detecting oscillations to, to infer if rule 4 exists in space or not. So cell motility is the biggest problem. If you have a rule 4 that is moving during uh, those 100 frames that we're using to calculate oscillations, we're not going to get any contrast uh, out of it. Or we might end up generating more noise. And if you see some of our T-cell uh, movies, especially the ones where you have an acting flow that is huge, uh, you will see that regions where the actin is moving highly, you almost get no signal out of there. So yes, uh, cell movement speed is going to be one of the biggest problems. Uh, we're almost using no priors. So our prior is the radial symmetry. Uh, and the fact is noise will generate some radial symmetry from time to time. So, so um, SARF will keep 
some degree of noise that exists already on our raw images. Uh, fortunately, noise is uncorrelated in time, so the moment that we start running autocorrelations uh, over time, we start clearing up uh, that noise. So I just wonder, although the curiosity, the fact that you have this wider symmetry, uh, is it really critical to have a good PSF, which is a really symmetric? Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, we, we've, we've actually been asked by reviewers to talk into that, and, and we created the website PSFs and showed that we still have conversions to the center of that PSF. Uh, of course, if you go into an astigmatism PSF where you actually have two peaks, then the algorithm will map those two peaks there. Uh, so there, there is still some dependence on how symmetric your PSF is. Thank you very much. Thank you.